Hi, I'm Conrad Marshall, and from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Good Weekend Talks, a magazine for your ears featuring in-depth conversations with fascinating people from sport and politics, science and culture, business and beyond. Every week you can download new episodes in which top journalists from across our newsrooms take a deep dive into the definitive stories of the day. This week is the final issue of the magazine for the year, featuring eight reflective pieces by acclaimed novelists. Your summer reading, as it were. So we thought it appropriate to offer a reflection or two of our own about the printed word. That means the format of the episode is a little different as we take a look at the specialist craft of magazine writing. With that in mind, the guest today is me. I've been a senior writer at the magazine for seven years now, putting together long-form stories and profiles on a range of topics, from the arts and science and quite often sport. I spend a lot of my time interviewing people, but today the shoe is on the other foot. Hosting this conversation is Good Weekend editor Katrina Strickland. G'day, boss. G'day, Conrad. Thank you for that. It's funny to say, welcome, Conrad. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for having me. (laughs) Pleasure. So readers, one of the things that I really like about Good Weekend is how much readers love byline, you know, often in newspapers and websites, readers don't notice the bylines, but they do notice the bylines of big pieces that we do. And so they'll say, I love Conrad Marshall's pieces. I love Jane Cadzo. I love Melissa Fife, Amanda Hooten. Tim Elliott. But they don't, Tim Elliott, exactly. But they don't know who that person is. They just know them through their writing. So why don't we start by saying, who is Conrad Marshall? (laughs) Tell us a really potted history of how you got into journalism. Did you always want to write? Did you always want to be a journalist? How how did it all happen? I always liked writing, but I didn't grow up wanting to be a journalist. I wanted to be a a psychologist and did that at university. Um, I eventually found my way into public relations and media and comms just through a couple of post-grad degrees. In Melbourne? Yeah, in Melbourne at Monash University because I sort of maybe just wanted to stick around academia for a while. But I found myself doing comms work and the stuff that I liked most tended to be the writing, whether it was putting together magazine stories or even company newsletters, press releases. So I did PR at Monash when a lot of news broke there. We had a a vice chancellor accused of plagiarism. Uh, While I was there, we had the um, sort of the only mass school shooting in Australian history when um, somebody got up in the back of a macroeconomics tutorial and and shot a bunch of people, killed five people, I think. Um, I was on campus that day and, look, it was... um, Always interesting to kind of cover the news from that side, but really it was writing those pieces that interested me most. And then I guess I got into newspapers uh, through a girl. Um, I followed a girl, an American, that I had met across to um, her tiny town in upstate New York, uh, and there weren't really a lot of high-paying <laughs> comms jobs mm. in upstate New York in the Adirondack Mountains, but there were newspapers everywhere because America has this amazing sort of ecosystem for uh, broadsheet papers. So this town would have been the size of Kyneton or so, you know, 30,000 people, but it had a daily five-section broadsheet newspaper. Wow. And I did a lot of stringing, freelancing for different papers around the area and then found my way into a part-time job there working four nights a week, monitoring the police scanner, going out and covering village zoning board meetings, spending my weekends at car shows and chili cook-offs and, I don't know, writing about local artists and identities and characters uh, and eventually went full-time there, spent five years uh, in that country town kind of honing my skills, which of which I had none because I'd never been taught journalism mm. as such. And you, you've talked yeah. about an editor there who was very influential on you. I think you've even posted photos with him on your Facebook page. Tell us what key lessons you learned there. Yeah, that was Will Doolittle, who was the the features editor at the time. I was very lucky to sort of start in features. It might have been a better grounding to start in hard news or politics, but it was certainly more fun writing Mm. features. And he was a big Ernest Hemingway fan. So I used to sort of stand behind him as he edited my copy, watching the things that he would take out. And it was sort of stunning to just see him delete four sentences within a paragraph and it just still retained all the power or integrity. Like you just 
began to understand that you could edit your way to a really good story mm. by by cutting. And was he harsh the way I remember when I was a cadet and an early journalist? You're so scared of those subs because they were often gr- grouchy and grumpy, and, <laughs> and but they really taught you by being tough, tough love. No, he was um, really great about it and, and that's good because I'm not sure I would have responded to the, the tough love or the gruff treatment. Um, he would just sort of read through the story going, oh, yeah, this is great, like this, and then he would slash a bunch of it and not say a word. <laughs> like this, but it's been cut <laughs> yeah, in half. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, yeah, people like him uh, and subsequent editors at other papers that I went to in the States, the Florida Times Union in Jacksonville, the Indianapolis Star in in the Midwest all taught me kind of similar lessons. And I would go to a lot of writers' conferences as well. They would send young reporters to to places and you'd learn from the best. So I vividly remember going to the, the National Writers Workshop in Hartford, Connecticut, when I was only a few years into the job and listening to this Pulitzer Prize winner, Tom French, who was the sort of the, narr- the narrative nonfiction newspaper god at the time, um, and he had these ten commandments for journalism, and I don't remember nine of them, but one of them stood out, and I, I used to teach it to kids in, in journalism classes that I taught. Um, it was get the always get the name of the dog, the brand of the beer, and the title of the song that was playing as the car crashed off the road. Because <laughs> details, details, yeah, details, 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 right? Like yeah. the name of the dog humanizes the person you're talking about mm. instantly. If you know that they called their dog Kenny or Spot or whatever, mm. it, it makes them more real. The brand of the beer tells you something specific about that person because mm. a Hoe Garden is super different than a Forex Gold. Mm. And the title of the song that um, was playing as the car crashed off the road is just an aspiration, like chase that detail that you're not likely to get, but man, if you do, like this, this sort of s- cinematic moment that you could craft if you manage to land that detail um, would be amazing. So that always stuck with me, maybe sometimes to um, too much of a degree. I feel like I can sometimes lean on that in on my writing too much. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because one of the things about um, really good magazine writing is in the fact gathering and the detail gathering and knowing that you're not going to use half of it. Yeah. Whereas if you're doing a shorter news story, you're trying to put really everything that you know into it. Magazine writing is quite different, isn't it? Because you you get this massive world of information, you know, reams of paper, lots of research, lots of detail, and then you're really only going to use what services the story. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's which is a profile. hard lesson to to learn, I think, if you're used to feeling like I got it, therefore I need to use it or show the reader that I know it. Oh, it's still hard to cope with now. I heard a writer, what was his name, Sam Anderson, who writes a lot of great long-form features for the, the New York Times magazine. I heard him talking about the process of gathering all of the stuff for his stories and he called it an ecstatic inhaling Mm. Because you're just, you're hoovering up everything that's given to you. Every quote that someone utters, um, description of every physical thing within a scene that you're in. So Mm. the place that you're interviewing someone or the shadowing that you're doing. And then all the detail that you're digging up in reports and research and studies. and, And it's so much fun, but you get to a point in it where you're like, how the hell am I going to distill all of this? How am I going to sort out what goes in and what goes out? Uh, And I still don't know how you kind of come to like make those decisions. That's the hard part of writing, I guess. It's why I agonize when I have to sit down and write it all because I'm invariably left with this sort of 50, 70 page document. That's what I do. I just pour it all into one document and then have to kind of whittle it down in order of importance and how I see the story unfolding. And actually I always, I remember people like Jane Cadzo in particular saying, I I over-research my stories and I as the editor always think you can never over-research. Like you feel like it's a waste but it's not. Mm. It's all, it's almost like, you know, the story is the tip of the iceberg and all that research is underneath but the tip is only good because of all that research. Tell us some reporters or some writers love the process of the fact gathering but find the writing just agony, you know, like the elephant through the eye of the needle, but then you come out the other side and love it. 
and others love the writing and really don't like the gathering. Where do you sit on on that? I think in every story there comes a point where you've broken its back, where you've spent two or three awful agonising days trying to write it, but you can see the shape that it's going to unfold in. And then, Mm. absolutely, I think I enjoy the writing and then particularly Mm. when the way I work is, let's say I've got a 5,000-word story due, I usually write kind of a 12,000-word version Mm. of it. And I do kind of, like I, I love hate the the task of um, shaving that down and polishing it and getting it to the right size and shape. Um, but it is it's it's more hate than love yeah. at times. Like um, what's that Dorothy Parker quote? I hate writing. I love having written. <laughs> We can all relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I do find it interesting, we've talked about this before as well, that you do that. You do the massive version and whittle it down, whereas Tim Elliott, one of our he other staff writers, up. builds it up to the word count and that's done. So just, everyone has such a different different method, don't I'm they, in so that respect? I'm so jealous of him for that. So <laughs> jealous. And no one can do it in a different way to what is their way. You've specialised, not entirely, but a, a little bit in sport. You do wonderful sport profiles and stories about sports teams. Why did that come about? Was that just a fan working out that they could also write about it or was it something more strategic? Um, no, it wasn't, wasn't as a fan. I mean, I'm, I am crazy about AFL, but beyond that, oh, I'm, really? I'm not, a <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't tell. Um, but beyond that, I'm not obsessive about any sport at all. I, I don't have an allegiance to a team in any other major mm. sport. I don't, uh, I don't watch them obsessively, but I do find them interesting to zero in on as individuals, whether it's athletes or coaches or um, the machinery behind it. And I think probably with the athletes, they interest me most because they lead such weird lives. Mm. Like I'm, I'm working on a, a profile right now for um, the special sort of tennis issue of the magazine that we're going to be bringing out. And it's a, it's a profile of Alex Dimonor, the kind of best Australian current player. Uh, and he made the decision to start playing tennis when he was 12. And he made this really serious decision to be like, I'm not going to go to school anymore, which means I'm not going to see all of my friends. And if this pans out the way that I want it to, uh, I'm not going to be seeing most of those people all throughout my teenage years and into my early 20s. I'm not going to be going to university. I'm going to miss weddings, parties, graduations, everything in service of this chance to make it as a yeah, great player. not even high chance. Yeah. I yeah. mean, he's a, he was a gun junior, but that doesn't mean anything. Like that might have meant he's the 78th best player in the world. And as we know, those those people like that rank around a hundred in tennis, they're eking out a living because mm. it's so expensive to fly all around the world. So I just kind of admire the risk and commitment mm. of that with um, So it's with the athletes. psychology in a way um, of how they get there and then how they live it. In terms of sports players though, it's very media managed, unlike some other areas that we write about. And you know, there's no one better than a sports player to sound like they're saying something interesting but actually give away nothing. They're mm. media trained, you know, from from the moment they join an elite professional team. Yeah. How do you get behind that? Um, I mean, there are different tricks you can use. Uh, one that I just picked up by basically reading um, – the stories that Martin Flanagan, the age sports writer, used to always write about footy players was he'd invariably ask them about where they started playing or he would take them specifically to that place. He'd go like, let's go talk at the Oval where you did Auskick before you became a champ and you immediately then take that adult back to childhood and get them talking in a much more honest way because they're talking about the game they love and the memories that they had of running across the grass rather than kind of the X's and O's of the weekend and the Mm. professional team that they play for. And so they're not quite as on guard. Mm. And maybe they also sense something in you that you're trying to ask something a bit more about who they are and less the less the professional and stage managed sort of life that they're living now. And if you crack them open a little bit like that at the beginning, probably the, the material that you get becomes um, 
more yeah more rich and deep and nuanced and has that become more of a problem trying to crack them in your career do you think everyone's got more and more advanced in how they know not to give things away or is it same as it ever was no i think it's it's getting worse and i don't know that it's um i don't know that it's on the back of sort of media training. We do like to imagine that they sit Mm. there in auditoriums and the comms director for the cricket club or whatever runs them through a bunch of scenarios. But it's just that there's so much media out there. They get to... They get good at it. Yeah, they get to read what people have said in newspaper stories and see what they say on camera. And it's pretty easy to mimic that Mm. because those people are saying nothing. And I reckon they just kind of learn by osmosis. That's what I'm supposed to sound like. So that's how I'll sound. You mm, know? Yeah. One of the things that I love about magazine writing is it's all about the greys. It's all about the nuance. You, you've got the length at four or 5,000 words to really – look at someone in the complexity of what a human is, whereas I think a lot of news reporting and even investigative reporting is much more black and white. It's about nailing whether the person did the right or wrong thing. Were you naturally drawn to feature writing because you're naturally more of a see the greys person? Because I I feel like a lot of feature writers are naturally that way inclined. Yeah, absolutely. I like to feel that I'm not not as judgmental as some people. Um, I I don't think of myself as a crusader for any particular cause. You know, not having grown up trying to chase a career in journalism, the goal for me was never to sort of hold truth to account and, you know. Nail someone. Yeah, nail yeah. someone to the wall or get onto the front page. The, the journalism that I grew up reading and loving actually was Good Weekend. Like mm. if I... I wasn't reading the sports pages of the age. I was devouring Good Weekend. I was mm. reading stories by like, the, I remember this one when I was 14 or 15 by Paul Tui, and it was about killer stallions, mm. like horses that are just violent and murderous but get cosseted because their offspring are worth so much money. Mm. And it was just this gripping, amazing read, and it enthralled and entertained, and that's what I always grew up wanting to do was Mm. the idea of being able to sit someone down for half an hour to be thoroughly engrossed in a story, Mm. not to mention the other kinds of things that Good Weekend writers got to do then. You know, there'd be a profile of Ewan McGregor, but it'd be sitting in a cafe in Dublin or a story about um, one of Picasso's mistresses who's now like 85 and living in an apartment in Manhattan and the writer Mm. transports you there. That's what I was always after. But you do, in a magazine piece, often have to nail something that yeah. is uncomfortable for the subject. How do you go about bringing that up in an interview when you know, say you did one with Ben Simmons, the basketballer, and you knew there were certain things that had happened in his career and personal life that you had to broach with him to get his response to, but you know that's going to get his back up, that might close down the kind of openness that you've had. How do you strategically deal with with that in in a long form interview, you hate to sort of be strategic or think in those terms, but you do right mm. because otherwise they might shut down the interview or, as you say, just not give you as much on the the back half of the time that you've been allotted with that person. So you definitely have to leave those sorts of questions until maybe three quarters of the way through, which mm. works as well because by then hopefully you've built up something of a rapport with the person, um, and you also. I think it helps if you're kind of a little bit upfront at the very beginning, uh, even when you're pitching the story. So you you might just sort of say to their handler or to them, like, I'm not here to write a good story. I'm not here to write a bad story. I'm here to write your story. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they respect that and sort of remember it a little bit when you do need to bring up the uncomfortable parts. But I will say they're they're always incredibly uncomfortable for me. Like Mm. I know that there are reporters who have ice in their veins and that's probably the part of the interview that they love Mm. or um, look forward to at least jotting down and recording. But um, it's the part I like least, definitely. But but 
good editors like yourself um, when you push and nudge and make, make sure that we back. get them and make <laughs> and make me go back um, only sort of strengthen the piece and give it more balance yeah. and yeah it's I crucial. think people would be listeners would be surprised to know how much rigor goes into a good weekend piece so tell us like how how much time do you spend I get asked this question so often and I know it's as long as a piece of string but Roughly, what? how much do you spend interviewing and researching and talking to a whole lot of people? And then how much do you spend writing and then take people through, like, yeah, the, yeah. the quite detailed editing process? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if I had to sum it up, for if we're talking about a kind of 5,000-word cover story, say, mm. there's probably three weeks or so that go into kind of doing interviews with this person. You want to make sure that you sit down with them for at least 90 minutes to start and then perhaps another hour follow-up. You want to shadow them on a couple of occasions. So there's a lot of time spent prior to that uh, just getting access, sometimes years, um, yes. n- niggling someone <laughs> trying to get access. We've played haven't we? We have. Um, and in between in fact- all of that, you're interviewing a bunch of other people as well. You need to get a list from that person to talk to, whether that's their mum or their dad, a a sister, a best friend, um, a colleague. And then you've got to go find all these other people to talk to about them. That they don't want you to talk to. Enemies and competitors and people they're not expecting you to talk to, like their Mm. childhood best friend. Um, And once you've gathered all of that and then also read every bit of research that you can find. Um, So for instance, uh, just we, we will have just printed a story on Taika Waititi that I wrote by the time this podcast comes out, I got various sort of archived files and LexisNexis searches done on him and read upwards of 300 stories about him, listened Mm. to five podcasts in which he featured just sort of hours and hours of immersing yourself in this person. Uh, And then you've got to sit down and condense all of that after the ecstatic inhaling Mm. uh, and write. And I don't know, the writing probably takes me about... A week, so like f- four You're a days quick writer, of- we should say. Some mm. some of our writers would take more, two or three weeks. But I think you're a week and then you spend another week whittling, wouldn't you say? A w- a w- like uh, five unless, days of unless writing. Unless it's a very tight deadline. Yeah, five days of writing, three days of whittling. And mm. then once it's submitted to you, it um, goes through a, you know, you've got questions, things that um, need filled in, and that always sort of scaffolds the story and makes it stronger. And then it goes through rounds of subbing, and you know some of those can be extraordinary. The mm. list of questions that they come back with and make you check, mm. not just names and ages, but lots of details. Where did you get that statistic from? I've found this alternative one. Can you really back that up? You need to go back to this person. And then just matters of phrasing. Uh, And there's two or three rounds of that. And then it gets proofread again on the page and you're checking over captions and headlines. And then we're producing it for online as well, looking for excellent links and things to embed. And so, yeah. Um, Dear yeah. listener, there's a there's a ton. It's a process. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you've also talked a lot about how you read very widely magazine writing, like you, as you just said. What are your favourite magazines to read that you've drawn the most inspiration and, I guess, um, lessons from? I think I used to read, like magazines are a bit different today, but when I was starting in journalism, they were super important to me, even though I was a newspaper writer. Mm. I had subscriptions living in the States to Esquire, GQ, New York, The New Yorker, The Economist, Rolling Stone, mm. Adirondack Life, Entertainment Weekly. <laughs> like, you have time uh, to work. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and for a while there, it was my discipline to try to read every one of them cover to cover, mm. but, a lot, but some of them were weekly and it was mm. just, um, you know, not possible. And mm. so then you begin to cherry pick the stories that you like most and things like Esquire. Uh, were almost like a manual for mm. me. I felt like I could look at the the story formats and the, the tone that was used and kind of try to mimic it in little daily newspaper stories, but it was all a grounding for the magazine pieces that I now write. And I guess the ones that I look at now, the big features that I end up sharing the most tend to come from the New York Times magazine. Mm. And more and more recently, The Atlantic Yes, seems to be the one I that agree. just produces the the sort of those these knockout 
pieces. And such interesting topics. Mm. You literally look at it and go, I want to go on to that. Right. I, I, I need to read that. Right, completely they're unexpected. Left to feel they're not in the news cycle, mm. but they're compelling. Yeah. And who are your favourite magazine writers? Let's just take all the Good Weekend ones out so you don't <laughs> offend anyone. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, look, in Australia for a while there, it was someone like Kate Legg. Uh, at Fantastic the weekend writer. Oz. We've had her on the podcast, actually. We have yeah. at the start of the mm. year a very popular episode about her book on uh, Affair. adultery affairs. affairs yeah, yeah. Um, but um, she always surprised me not just with her turn of phrase, which was brilliant, but uh, the way she could skewer people and organisations, the the access that she somehow got to. Mm to people and inner sanctum stories and mm. boardroom machinations. Like it was really just deeply impressive. But, um, you know, in the daily sense, I think Greg Baum is probably the the best writer that we've got at The Age in the Sydney Morning Herald, the sports columnist from The Age. He's um, just really gifted and someone I've been reading for decades. Mm. Uh, but the standout would probably be Gary Smith, who's retired from Sports Illustrated in America. He won the National Magazine Award there several times, just beating out writers from every magazine because his stories were like kind of this mix of being like a novella and a poem and an essay. Like they just Mm. weren't traditional articles and they stand up to reading even now like – go back and look at the SI vault and Google shadow of a nation or crime and punishment and Gary Smith and you won't regret it. Okay. And final question, what's your big challenge for the next year or two, either in who you want to nab to profile or in the kind of story you want to do or some breakthrough that you'd like? Um, look, I, I probably say every year that I'd like to challenge myself by doing a write around story. So I've always admired the way Just that. Just explain what that is. Yeah. So I've always admired the way that Jane Cadzo has been able to do these. It's basically a, a story about someone who doesn't want a story written about them, um, which means they're usually very high profile, very powerful, and able to sort of shut down their networks from talking about them. And so she's done great ones on people like Greg Norman but even Gina Reinhart mm. and I um, can't remember if it was Kerry Packer or James Packer, but one of the Packers. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I was marvelled that she was able to do that and so I've thought to myself that would be a wonderful thing to do. And I also think as um, despite being somebody who's not immersed in the Canberra bubble or has covered um, politics, I'd, I'd love to write about uh, a politician, mm. I, I think, they're interesting characters um, beyond all of the, yeah, that inner, inner Canberra bubble stuff as, um, as a recent profile of Jim Chalmers by Deb Snow showed. Like I was just 90% of that was about the person and his motivation and not the sort of internal politicking of Canberra mm. and it was gripping because of it. Yeah, and I think we've talked in the past about how good it is to mix up so that, you know, you don't just become the person who only does sports profiles so that, say, Amanda Hooten can do a sports profile and Jane's not the only person who does a political profile. I do think you can bring new things by having writers who aren't used to doing that area. Exactly right. In, into that area and, and they bring a fresh insight. Thank you, Conrad. Always a pleasure to read your writing and talk to you and um, see you all in 2024. Indeed. Thanks very much, Katrina. Good Weekend Talks is brought to you by the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Subscriptions power our newsrooms. To support independent journalism, search subscribe Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. And if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe, rate and comment wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of Good Weekend Talks is produced by Chi Wong. Editing from Conrad Marshall. Tom McKendrick is head of audio. Ruby Schwartz is head of podcasting. And Katrina Strickland is the editor of Good Weekend.